Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Distinguished Awards event 2022. My name is Margaret Greasy. I'm part of Executive Council of Faculty, Faculty Assembly, and I'm filling in for our President Menaka Abraham, who had a prior commitment, and Huan Tong Sun, who is snowbound today. So we have at least beautiful weather outside, clear weather anyway. Um, so let's get started, and we will begin with our uh, coordinator, Andrew, giving the land acknowledgement. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Want to take a moment to recognize that our university sits on the ancestral homelands of the Puyallup tribe of Indians, whose ancestors have lived on and cared for this land for thousands of years. Please join me in expressing our deepest gratitude to the Puyallup and other Coast Salish peoples for their long, enduring, and continued care for this region's land and waterways. Thank you. Thank you for that, Andrew. And Andrew Siebert, who has also done a lot of organizing for this event. Uh, today, we are going to celebrate the accomplishments of two distinguished faculty who are the award winners for 2023. They are the distinguished. Uh, they are the distinguished research award 2022 recipient, Dr. Aaron Casey and Distinguished Teaching Award 2022 recipient, Dr. Claudia uh, Selmeyer. I am first pleased to welcome EVCAA Dr. Andy Harris to give a remark. As we know, the Office of Academic Affairs invites the nominations and organizes review committees to recognize the best teaching and research work annually at UWT. Please welcome Dr. Harris. Thank you, Margaret. It's a pleasure being here. Uh, welcome faculty, administrators, guests, and honored recipients of the 2022 Distinguished Teaching Award and the 2022 Distinguished Research Award. Claudia and Aaron, it is a pleasure. I'm looking around. Oh, there you are. <laughs> the, lar the larger instanti instantiation of you is, is out there. Um, it is a pleasure and a privilege to welcome you and to welcome all of you uh, here and to be a part of this recognition of your accomplishments by uh, and in the company of your peers. Um, uh, I would like to start by thanking the members of each committee uh, who put so much of their time uh, into this. Uh, the Distinguished Research Award Committee, uh, Haluk Demirkan, uh, Sharon Lang, Michael McCourt, Amos Nascimento, and Barb Taves. Barb, I think I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Uh, and the Distinguished uh, Teaching Award Committee, uh, Wei Chao Yuan, Aaron Hastings, Morgan Hines, Yuta Heller, uh, Danica Miller, and Monica Sobolewska. Uh, thank you. I would also like to thank uh, Tammy Jez in the Office of Academic Affairs for her work coordinating this committee and generally making this run so well with uh, Andrew Siebert, uh, with Margaret, uh, and with Menica and Hua Tong and faculty assembly leadership. Um, Aaron and Claudia, I take no credit uh, for your accomplishments, but I want to say that it was such a pleasure to read about them uh, in, such, uh, in such depth. Um, I did not review uh, your uh, materials uh, with the comprehensiveness that the committees did, but, but what I read uh, made me proud to be uh, this institution that has nourished you and given you a place uh, to do the wonderful things that you've done. Please join me now in congratulating and celebrating Dr. Aaron Casey and Dr. Claudia Selmeyer. Thank you very much, Dr. Harris. Uh, we are now going to have our Distinguished Teaching Award winner, Dr. Claudia Selmeyer, uh, come to the stage. Let me tell you a little bit about her. She incorporates high-impact practices such as service learning and independent mentored projects in her teaching. Each of her classes has some component of community engagement service learning or real world application built into the curriculum. Selmeyer regularly receives strong course evaluations from her students who report feeling respected, included, 
supported, and encouraged to try new things. During her time at UW Tacoma, Dr. Selmeyer has created and implemented new coursework at both the undergraduate and graduate levels in the field of disability studies. Her talk is Spaces for Change, Inside and Out. Please uh, welcome Dr. Selmeyer to the podium. Thank you, everyone usually used to walking around, so I will try to stay put and not use my hands too much. Thank you everyone for the introductions and thank you again for, for this award. I kind of want to start out to acknowledge that this would not have been, this is not just my work, right, that I think we're celebrating today, but it's based on mentoring that I received these are courses that I also inherited. This is based on other people's writing about pedagogy and teaching. This is due to my students in the class. So this is a team effort. I'm standing here today, but I'm representing much more than just my ideas or my work. So I wanna say that first before kind of diving into the talk. As I was preparing for this presentation. I was thinking about the teaching award ceremonies I've been to before, and there was quite some pressure because I've been to a lot of impressive presentations. So I was like, what will I talk about, right? I need to come up with a good idea and do 15 minutes of kind of showing that I was worthy for this award. So I went back to the description and thank you for reading it out again. And one of the descriptions for this award was that, as we just heard, right, each of my classes has this component of community engagement, service learning, real world application. So this is kind of the inspiration for this talk today to think about what does that look like? What does that mean? How does it show up in my classes? That's the title, Spaces for Change Inside and Out. So I want to start out um, kind of as some personal reflection, which I also include in my classes. And it is also important for my students to think about what motivates them to engage in change, right? To be a social worker, to think about policy change, community change. And it's important that we kind of reflect on what, what are these motivations, right? Where does it come from? And I think they can be great catalysts for change, right? My anger, my sadness, my fear, I can use those emotions and harness them to really kind of see, be the change in the world that we wanna see. So for me, there is kind of two main historic events that I think are not the only shaping factors, but that play a big role in my interest in kind of that advocacy and policy work. I'm German. Thanks for pronouncing my name right. <laughs> um, Claudia Selmeyer. Um, so the events that I'm talking about here come from that German history. Um, on the your left, we see a memorial for the Holocaust in Berlin. And so this is kind of one big major event, um, the Holocaust, Nazi Germany, that shapes how I think about the importance of policy work, the importance of showing up as individual citizen. And I wasn't born back in the days, so I don't have, wasn't personally there. Um, but I think it comes with a responsibility that I still feel that feels very personal to me um to not just know about the history but to think about how can sh i show up in my life now to make sure that we don't see this again right where can i show up in my work in my social relationships to really think about social justice and again this is comes kind of from this historic background the other image which isn't that great resolution I see, <laughs> is um, the Berlin Wall. 
with people sitting on top. And it's um, about the Berlin Wall coming down in November of 1989. I was alive back then. <laughs> um, but I grew up in, Ber in Bavaria, not close to the wall. But I definitely remember the when you have the news, right, and then comes the weather at the end, and you see that map of Germany and kind of half of it was blank. Um, so I definitely have those memories of the separation. And thinking back 1989, I think everyone thought that's just how it is, right? We settled in, the immediate danger kind of settled down, but nobody could imagine or picture that this wall would ever come down. And I think what is so amazing about this change, um, first of all, because it was massive and unexpected, but also what I tell my students, it was ordinary people showing up. It's people organizing, demonstrating, meeting in churches, um, having bird vigils and things like that. So it's, it's really driven by grassroots movements, right? By the people um, to see that, that change happen. And I think it is a, a motivation to keep going and to also make see that change can happen, right? I think sometimes we feel very overwhelmed. Um, there's a lot of bad news and we feel so small and we feel like, what can I do about this? And I think this image for me shows that we can all do something if we show up in the ways that work for us, right? And we all show up differently, but there are these opportunities and then big things can happen. So as my students also think about this, kind of what excites me, right? What motivates me? It shows up in my projects that they always pick their topic. So there is not a set, you have to advocate for this policy or you need to do this research project, but pick what is interesting to you. So I always see a wide variety of topics and interest areas because I think it's important that we work on what kind of excites us individually. Another piece that is important as we think about change is not just that self-reflection piece around motivation, but also a reflection on how do I see the world, right? We don't, we're not neutral, at least that's my understanding. We're not just neutral beings seeing, having like objective images, reflections of the world, right? But how we see the world is influenced by how we grew up, where we live, our past experiences, present experiences. So one activity um, I do is to show these two pictures and ask, you're my students now, what, what do you see? What is going on when you look at these two pictures? What do you think is happening there? Anyone brave? Living life. Living life, uh-huh. Anything else? So what are just the things we see? And it's maybe hard to see, it's a little bit dark. <laughs> but people in the front rows, what is actually just going on? Okay, so right, but there's a kid roasting maybe marshmallows or definitely poking in the, in the flames. Maybe on the left-hand side, anybody taking a stab? Uh-huh, right, there's things laying around. We see some tires, there's a, a bike laying there. There looks like some bridge or something, a garbage can type thing. So yeah, it looks like garbage laying around. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so okay, the old furniture, there's some planks, like some boards, right, kind of stacked up in the, in the background as well. What do you think is the, the, so kind of we see, it seems garbage, old furniture, there's a kid playing with fire. What do you think is the point of this? Is it just pictures of a garbage dump? 
probably not, right? It's kind of, I might not show you a picture of just that. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Got it. Mm -hmm. Right, right. That's what Andrew said. It's kind of um, live happening. But yes, right. The kid is smiling. It definitely seems, um, you know, have to seem to have a good time. But maybe not what we would expect to to see. Um, in the past few years, it's been interesting because I've been showing that picture for a few years that students have uh, been reminded of some of the encampments that we have in town. So there was kind of sometimes they didn't see necessarily joy there, right? But they are worried about, oh no, do they not have a home? Is that kind of where they live? The thing is, this is a playground in the UK. So it is joy, right? So the kid is actually having, hopefully, a good time at the playground. But it looks very different maybe than a playground, what we would expect a playground to look like. Because um, there is all this garbage looking things, um, a kid playing with open flames, right? We don't necessarily see supervision or grown ups around. Um, but it is that place for creativity, right? Because you can build with the things you find, you reuse materials. Um, and the um, background idea is here that it, yes, it inspires your creativity because it's not predetermined. It's not just a climbing structure, and that's what it is. That's one thing you can do. But every time you come, right, you can reinvent that sofa and turn it into a new thing. So it's great for your imagination. There's also research showing that some of that more dangerous play is actually safer because it's clear that this is hot. I need to be careful around a flame. Actually, our very safe play structures, the chances for accidents are higher because kids climbed further up because they think it's fine, it's safe. And kids that climb up trees go only as far as they know they can come back down. So actually, when we look at some of that, it's not necessarily more dangerous, right? Because we get a better sense of what is the risk? How much risk can I take? How can I keep myself safe? So the activity here is also to really think about something that maybe looks to me like garbage is actually play and fun for somebody else, right? What we think, especially when we think about social work and child welfare, what we think about a good family structure, a good family environment, where do these images and ideas come from, right? Is that really predetermined, true for everyone, or how much is it also influenced kind of by my own upbringing and my own ideas around what is safe and what is the right environment? So kind of this helping us maybe to shake some of our, our notions also of what is good childhood and what isn't. As we kind of reflect on our own ideas around childhood in this example, um, I'm also always bringing in, we don't just need to kind of have that self-reflective piece, but we also need to think about what are existing practices and policies when we wanna think about change, right? We, wanna, we need to know what is in place right now to get a sense of where do we wanna see the change we want. And this is just a brief excerpt from a New York Times article called Foster Care as Punishment, the New Reality of Jane Crow. And students read through this example um, and then talk kind of in small groups. What do they see kind of is problematic in terms of the responses of the uh, children's services? What were the problems that the family faced? and to think about how could we intervene differently in this, this instance. And as you can see kind of in this one example, there are struggles for the family in terms of kind of what we could you know, think about neglect because there are um, cockroaches and it's not clean the house, right? There might be mold and other um, problems going on. 
um, but also to realize, right, that the problem isn't that the parent doesn't do a good job caring for their children, right? The problem is poverty and how we're leaving families alone to deal with, you know, a landlord that doesn't keep up with maintenance. Um, and, you know, yeah, the, the problem of poverty overall and how we're um, punishing and um, criminalizing poverty. So kind of, again, as an example, especially as we think about social work, what are we doing, right? And where are we also implicit in our own practices keeping up um, on just systems? Checking the time. I think I should be done. <laughs> so um, with all this kind of reflection and analysis, we also, in the end, need to really think about practical skills, right? So a big part of teaching my, in my classes is also to think about how does a bill become a law, revisit that dance thing, remember that, the bill? Um, but also, how do you write a letter to your legislature? How do you write an editorial, right? So it's really kind of also about hands-on practical skills. Um, and also to think about what I am I good at, right? We don't all have to go to protests. That might not work for me. I maybe just want to write an email, right? But there are different ways to engage and to find out what is the best way for, for you. And also to kind of deconstruct some of our notions of what an activist or an advocate looks like, um, that we have the myth of the saint that does everything right, or this is a lone fighter that just shows up at the right time, um, or the expert, right? A lot of my students say, but I don't know everything about this. Who am I to speak up, right? And in the end, to think about all of us as good enough activists. Showing up, even if it's a little bit, is better than not showing up. And again, some of my history, when we think about Nazi Germany, that was exactly the problem, right? People not showing up in, in no way. I had a little video, but I don't know. What's the timing? Can you give me a time? I don't want to cut Erin short with her. Time. Um, we'll <laughs> Here we go. It is just so um, an example. It's um, a student, Christy Breton. She it was in my in the BSW program. She's now an advanced standing student, and she took uh, one of my classes and then over the summer implemented her own advocacy to advocate with her local school board around um, going back, uh, that was COVID times, or we we're still in, but deep COVID times. And she was advocating around safety and not going back in person. But she talks about kind of what she did, how she organized, and it's just, a, right, I can say all these things here, it's just a great example to hear how a student actually took the skills and then independent of classwork, she did not get a grade for this, right? But really went out and implemented what she learned in class. Thank you. <laughs> Am I good? I did it. Okay, I don't think there's any doubt why Dr. Stellmeyer won this award. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, now we are going to welcome Dr. Erin Casey, who received the Distinguished Research Award for 2022. Dr. Casey's work has been published in more than 60 peer review publications and has been cited more than 2,400 times. Dr. Casey's research focuses on violence prevention and engaging communities in prevention strategies. Her current research examined men's involvement in anti-sexual and domestic violence movements. Dr. Casey has over 100, uh, 100, has over 10 years of clinical experience. <laughs> Sorry about that. Has over 10 years of, of, of clinical experience doing intervention, prevention, and administrative work in the fields of sexual and domestic violence. Let us welcome Dr. Casey to the podium. Thank you. All right, 
hasn't been quite that long, but sometimes it feels like it. Um, so I just want to start by saying, Claudia, thank you for your amazing presentation. As per usual, you set the bar intimidatingly high. And as always, I benefit from being in the same school as Dr. Selmeyer and learn a tremendous amount from you every day. So thank you for your presentation. I kind of wish I had gone first. <laughs> I would like set the bar low. Um, and I also, um, like Dr. Selmeyer, want to express my gratitude um, for this award. Um, this campus is just full of incredibly creative, innovative scholars who um, engage local communities and communities more broadly to tackle real world problems and, um, and do it in just wicked smart ways. And if truth be told, I would rather be sitting there listening to many of you in this room who do amazing work. Um, and I think as a campus, there's so many folks who we need to recognize on an annual basis for the work they do. So thank you for this. Um, I am going to use this opportunity, though, to climb up on a 15 minute soapbox. So you have been duly warned. So uh, my career as a social worker um, and sub subsequently my research has focused on understanding and preventing um, and responding to interpersonal violence, primarily sexual violence and sexual and domestic violence. Um, and I have to admit that that, uh, to be frank, makes me a bit of a bummer <laughs> in social situations. Um, talks with the word violence in the title are a little bit of a tough sell. And at parties, I find that when people ask me what my research focuses on and I say sexual assault, People develop an urgent and sudden need to go refresh their drink. Um, and you may be experiencing a similar case of buyer's remorse at this moment, um, which I say somewhat tongue in cheek, but also seriously, because violence is an issue that impacts all of us directly or indirectly in deeply impactful ways. And so even when we talk about it in general terms um, and in relatively benign terms, as I hope to in the next few minutes, it's a topic that touches that kind of pokes at the tender spots. So I say this um, to give folks permission that if indeed you are one of those folks with a case of buyer's remorse, either online or here in person, I give you permission to space out and think about your grocery list or go out into the lobby and refresh your drink because um, this can be a, a challenging topic. Um, and it's an important one because it deeply impacts our students' lives. So what I hope to share a little bit about is um, one strain of my research over the past few years that has looked at the experiences of students like ours, students on primarily non-residential campuses with respect to um, how violence shows up in their lives and what it means for their educational journey. Um, and like Claudia, I'm going to start with a little bit of a story. So I have been in this field not for 100 years, but for almost 31 years, um, well over half my life. I entered the field in the fall of 1992 when as a senior and a newly minted Rape Crisis Center volunteer at my college in Southern California, I took my first ever crisis call in my dorm room on a phone that looked exactly like this one, which I was thrilled to find on the internet. And um, the young woman on the other end of the line was someone I'll call Megan. Um, she was calling from a phone booth. And like me, she was a college student at a school not that far from where I was. She had dropped out recently in the aftermath of a sexual assault. Um, but then once home, she started um, surfacing some earlier traumatic memories and didn't feel safe at home. So that night, she had left without anything and needed a place to stay. So we were on the phone for maybe 10 minutes, and the Rape Crisis Center I worked for had a motel voucher system where folks could um, get vouchers to stay in a place for a few nights. I helped her figure out how to um, uh, navigate that and connect with the agency in the morning for more ongoing services, and we hung up. And obviously, I never got the opportunity to talk to her again. So I don't know if she ever went home. I don't know if she ever went back to school, her own campus or another campus. I don't ultimately know how that trauma impacted her life. And in the 10 years after that, that I spent working with survivors of sexual assault and domestic violence, I heard hundreds of stories. And all of them were exceptional and um, inspiring. And, but few of them are still kind of crisp, as crisp in my mind as Megan's story. Maybe because it was my first call, or maybe because she, like a student, was, was a student like me down the street. 
um, or maybe it's because I've spent so much time since on college campuses and have seen over and over and over again how violence can sometimes temporarily, sometimes permanently, seriously interrupt or derail folks' educational goals and, um, and journeys. A couple years before that call, or five years before that call, um, a researcher at, the, at Arizona State University named Mary Koss released a groundbreaking study that first really set the kind of benchmark for our understanding of the prevalence of sexual assault in this country. Um, in a national study of undergraduate women, she found that about 15% of women had experienced rape in, since the age of 14, and many more had experienced other unwanted sexual experiences. Um, those rates didn't differ by type of institution, small, large, commuter, non-commuter, uh, liberal arts college, larger college. That is a devastatingly high number of Megans. And um, because we thought of violence in kind of a more limited way, then it doesn't reflect the experiences of men, of transgender and non-binary students, or the intersectional ways that people experience and respond to violence. So this is kind of our baseline, 1987. Um, I, after my career in social work, I went back and got my doctorate, and I came to this campus 17 years ago in the fall of 2006, almost 17 years ago, and um, started working on uh, research related to violence prevention. Shortly after I got here, another one of the kind of benchmark studies in my field came out when my phone looked more like this now, so 23 years later. Um, the CDC issued a, the results of a nationally representative survey of adults in the United States about the scope of violence and found that about 18% of women and 2% of men had experienced rape in their lives. Again, many more other kinds of sexual violence. And they used similar kinds of methods as were used by Mary Koss 23 years earlier. So in those 23 years, although many things had changed and there was a lot more public investment in, in violence prevention and response, rates of violence had not shifted. On this campus, the, the kind of first um, data that we have available about students' experiences came in 2016. So it was um, in 2015, the Washington State Legislature mandated that all two and four year colleges in Washington State do a sexual misconduct climate survey to get a sense of victimization rates on their campus. And um, I was the UWT rep to the tri-campus um, committee that put together that survey and implemented and analyzed the data. And you can see here the numbers from 2016 in terms of what our own undergraduates on this campus reported experiencing. Um, I use this data because it's the most rigorous data we have, even though it's getting less and less recent. So although the 2019 climate survey asked a little bit about victimization, because there were so many topics covered in that climate survey, um, the number of questions specific, specifically about sexual violence were pretty limited. So about 10% of, of female students and about a quarter of our transgender and non-binary students reported experiencing rape in their life. About a quarter of our students on this campus reported at least one incident of sexual harassment since enrolling on campus. And of students um, who had experienced a victimization, 14% said they dropped out of a class or stopped participating in an, in an educational opportunity as a result. Um, these numbers are a little bit lower than some of what we see on the national um, scale. They were a little bit lower than numbers that Seattle campus found. They're still completely unacceptably high. Uh, but in, on, on the Seattle campus, numbers are a little bit higher, in large part because of um, victimizations that are happening in the context of the Greek system. Still, we know that UWT students are, of course, the best. And like many other um, students from on not primarily non-residential colleges, um, they are unique and have unique needs. So we know that many non-residential students, um, this is not new news to any of you, um, are maybe a little bit older than other students, come with a lot of lived and professional experience to our campus, often juggle multiple roles, may have families, may work full or part-time or multiple jobs. They may work all night before they come to class in the morning. And all of those things about them shape the way that if violence happens in their lives, they may understand it and respond to it. But a lot of the programs that we have or prevention work that are available writ large in higher education are based on 
kind of an understanding of a quote unquote traditional student on a four year campus or a largely residential campus. A lot of the programming is around situational awareness at, in the Greek system or at, at parties in ways that don't necessarily speak to the experiences of our students. Um, so a few years ago, a couple colleagues and I, Sarah Hampson and Alyssa Ackerman, decided to um, get more information from our students and students on other residential camp, non-residential campus about their experiences of violence and how that was showing up in their lives. Um, and I wanna, there's so much incredibly smart stuff that the students told us. I wish I could just share all of it with you, um, but I'm gonna pick out two little snapshots of what we heard from students that I think are relevant to how we respond to folks. Um, one of the things we heard really clearly, and this is borne out in quantitative data as well, is that um, most students um, on our campus, experience, when they experience violence, it happens in their private lives. It happens at home, it happens in the context of their, um, their family or their intimate relationships, which is a little bit different than what we often think of in terms of campus sexual assault and, and incidents that are happening on campus. And because of this, sometimes students aren't sure if this campus or other non-residential campuses are places where they can come to get help or if their experiences at home are relevant to what's um, happening on campus. So for example, um, one student said, UWT students experience the off-campus kind of violence or assault, and I think it impacts them tremendously. It can literally change and reformat the way that you think, and that plays a huge role in stress levels and how you prioritize your time. Because people get to the point where they're so stressed, they're like emotionally unstable or hurt, that they pri prioritize that over education. Because they're like, I gotta take care of myself before I think about my degree. Another student said, I keep bringing up the community building part of it, but I think that's really important because I think that somebody that is suffering from violence that didn't happen on our campus, then they wouldn't connect it, like would not go to anybody on this campus. So it ha if it happened off campus, why would you go to a counselor on campus? So students may need extra support to see violence happening in their private lives or other things happening in their private lives as something that we care about on this campus, which we absolutely do. We have amazing services available on this campus, but students may not see their campus community as their primary community for, for reaching out for that support. But we also heard, um, a lot from students about their confidence and optimism in supports if they did need it on campus. Um, so we asked students, have you heard of, of the violence related services on campus? Um, have, have you experienced with those? Most students didn't know a whole lot at the time about what services were available, but they had a lot of optimism about the, the welcome they would receive should they go there because of their relationships with other folks on campus. So everyone on this campus is a walking ambassador for the entree or the avenue into services. So one student, for example, said, I haven't gone to counseling services, but when I go to academic advising, I've always had very positive experiences. Yay, academic advising. Um, I got a good impression from the beginning, so I would feel comfortable reaching out. Another student, this is really typical, we heard this over and over again, my math professor asked me how I was doing and connected me to all these places on campus. So I feel like everyone's kind of welcoming. Um, in contrast, we heard that a lot of students feel that the short amount of time they spend on campus makes it hard to make friends. And friends we know in general in the literature about sexual violence are the ways that folks reach out for support or get information about where else to go. And so the fact that people have such close connections with faculty, with staff, with different offices on campus means those are incredibly important relationships to leverage as avenues into support um, in ways that don't even require any of us to use the word violence. All right, things are gonna take a, a turn <laughs> again here. Um, we know that, uh, you know, as I said, that experiences of violence can have profound effects on folks, including on in their educational journey. And that is also true in, uh, at UW Tacoma. And so I wanna switch back to some quantitative data here. Uh, Dr. Bhattacharya and I spent a little bit of time actually looking at the 2019 climate data um, and looking at the relationship between experiences of violence and considering leaving the institution. So one of the questions you may recall in that climate survey was about whether folks had ever seriously considered leaving UW Tacoma. 
And in general, at the time in 2019, about 20% of our undergrads had seriously considered leaving at some point. When you break that down by victimization status, folks who've experienced sexual harassment, about twice the proportion have had seriously considered leaving the institution. Um, if you look at it in terms of sexual assault and break it down by sexual assault, that, that contrast is even higher. Um, so certainly, we, all of the, the usual um, cautions about uh, correlation and causality apply here. Um, and yet, I think these differences are marked enough, are stark enough, um, that we're on safe ground, kind of pointing at the experiences of victimization as part of students' calculus about persevering in their education and persevering here. I know we're a little bit short on time, so I'm going to skip ahead just a tiny bit. But I wanted to share the tidbit that in our um, look at the climate survey data, Dr. Bhattacharya and I found that of all the campuses, students reach out to supportive services on this campus um, the most. So actually, it rates two to three times higher than students on the Seattle campus and higher than rates on other campuses. We are doing a lot right here. And this campus and the university as a whole has invested in the past few years in violence services and counseling services and wraparound services in amazing ways that are showing up in the data. Um, so I think the, the, the gap is not that we have, don't have amazing services available. It's that we could encourage and find pathways for even more of our students to connect with, with um, those offices, the Office of Student Advocacy and Support, with PAWS, um, with our confidential advocate, with the, which the university in, invested in for the first time a few years ago. Um, so we are, we're doing a lot right. And I'm going to skip ahead a little bit here. Um, I'm going to make good on my claim that I'm, again, kind of a buzzkill at parties and um, share some more bad news. Uh, just last week, the CDC released findings from the latest iteration of the Youth, youth Risk Behavior Study, which is a semi-annual um, survey that's done in high schools across the country. And they found that 14% of girls and 20% of LGBTQ plus youth had ever been forced to have sex. So these rates actually represent increases from what had been steady and already unacceptably high rates for decades. So um, although we, these are not exact apples to apples comparisons, Dr. Koss surveyed college students, the CDC talks to high school students, um, I think we can be somewhat confident that rates of sexual violence have not meaningfully decreased in 36 years. Phones have changed. Massive social change has occurred. Rates of sexual violence have not meaningfully decreased in 36 years. I have to admit that I cried for a little bit in my office when I read that New York Times article releasing these findings. Um, I figure that I have about 15 more years left in my career, assuming my children who are teenagers like make it through college in a timely fashion, um, could be a little more or less. I would really, really, really love to see these rates come down in a way they have not yet in the last 31 years of my career. And I think we have enough knowledge about how to support survivors and about how to prevent violence that we absolutely can make this happen. So I want to share just a couple of thoughts, mostly that actually come from our own students, about action steps that we can take, action steps you are already taking as advocates for your students. And there's lots of kind of um, domains in which we could think about action steps. We certainly need to think about how to reduce incidents of sexual harassment. We could certainly use more resources devoted to primary prevention, stopping violence before it begins. But I'm going to focus a little bit on how we support students who are survivors, because that um, is what we've heard so much from students about. And some of this is what I've already uh, chatted about. Um, we've heard again and again from students that each of us is an ambassador for the amazing services that we have on this campus. Um, and that we, like, like students who are housing insecure or like students who are food insecure, we don't ever have to talk directly about those issues um, to, to reinforce the message of connection and belonging um, and kind of the, taking care of the whole student that we um, care about. 
we need to continue to normalize that UW T is committed to that whole student and that barriers to educational success, even those that folks are experiencing in their private lives, are things they can get support for here. This campus has done this a lot, um, but continuing to increase the issue, the visibility of um, the issue of violence and services and information about services of violence. Stu we know that students reach out when they get redundant messaging, repetitive messaging about what's available to them. We know that students reach out when their friends recommend services, when their faculty recommend services. Um, and so continuing to think about creative ways to get that message out. We have a lot of prevention resources available across the tri-campus um, system. I'll call out the Husky, and Pre Husky Prevention and Response course that has modules you can pull out and share in class, or modules you can go back and review about how to respond to a student who shares a story with you, or about the um, range of services that we have on this campus. And we can advocate for more resources for education and prevention. We heard from our students again and again that um, they wanted to have opportunities to talk about healthy relationships and consent and how to talk to their kids about these issues. And that's something we could invest in more on this campus. Um, one idea students had was, was to have more um, low credit bearing courses that students could use to get above that financial aid threshold that um, share health and wellness messages in the context of a credit um, of, of lower division class. So I'm going to pause there. I know we are running a little bit late. Thank you for indulging my soapbox speech. And thank you for everything you do for our students, because I think that really shines through this data. All right.